you don't sell your best young players if you have got that ambition. Um, I wanted to I wanted to win things in the games. I wanted to play on the biggest stage. So in the limo to your house, I was living in, in Springhead in Oldham. So we're going to take you down to Barton. We're going to send Richard's helicopter up for you, fly down to London, show you the facilities at the Stoop, where they played at Harlequins, house in Richmond where, where we'll live. And he says, and then on to, to meet the man himself for his house, at his house in Holland Park for dinner. Well, uh, Paul Scalfort, we've had a lot of conversations over the years. I've done quite a lot of work with you, but I don't feel like we've ever properly sat down to talk about your career and, and your playing time in depth. Um, I want to take you back to kind of the first time that you're, you were consciously aware of what rugby league was and, and that how you kind of ended up getting gripped by it in the way that you were. Yeah, it was, it was funny, uh, my introduction into, into rugby. So I, it was eight-year-old as a... As a Back in back in Oldham, uh, my, my dad played for Oldham St Anne's. We used to go to the games, kick a ball about on the on the side of the field. But I actually followed my eldest brother Lee, wanting to be a a footballer. So he was playing for a team called Fells with Tigers, uh, and I I wanted to to follow suit. There was an advert in the Oldham Evening Cron in the paper advertising for a new rugby team, a team called Wrighton Tigers. Uh, my younger brother Danny wanted to to go. Uh, and I got made to go with him. It was in the summer holidays, so it was easy, easy childcare. Um, I went to the this first ever session. I remember kicking and screaming all the way there. I didn't want to play rugby league, um, but from that first hour, you know, absolutely loved it. My next question was going to be if you had a kind of eureka moment where you thought, "I love this and I'm decent at it." But I guess for you, then was it that? first session that you, you ever picked it up? Yeah, it was that first session, you know, I knew, I, I, you know, I got to, to grips with, with rugby league. I enjoyed the physicality of it, you know, I was the middle one of, of, of three brothers, so I'd always, we'd always been physical anyway. Uh, and, and just thoroughly really enjoyed that first time. And then, you know, got to play my me, me, me first game. Uh, I always played a year above, so I was an eight year old playing in the under nines. And my first game was at High Barn School against, uh, against Thameside. Uh, I scored a couple of tries and, and kicked the goals as well. So mm. it was uh, pretty much instant that I knew I was I was I was pretty decent. Um, but again, thoroughly enjoyed it. At what point did it become a kind of idea in your head that maybe you could make a, a career out of this, and you know you maybe able to do it for a living? I think pretty early on, pretty maybe that first year, uh, I ended up playing for for Greater Manchester Youth under under nines, uh, captain the side at the year below. That was the first time we ever played. Alongside my good mate Adrian Marley, uh, Moz was a, a school year older than me, so we played in the in the same team. And pretty much from then, you know, I had my heart set on in, in doing well in this game, and, and potentially, you know, I used to go watching Oldham rugby anyway. Um, so I, I knew obviously the, the professional game, um, and pretty much set me my heart on, on on being a professional, you know, rugby league player pretty early. It's always interesting when you, you kind of speak to people. Rugby league being what it is, a lot of these players have been playing with or against each other since they were eight, nine, ten years old. You, you mentioned Moz. How early did that swinging arm first come into his game? Very early, very early. I think from probably from from game one that I, I played against him. Um, I remember one game. Me and Moz always laugh about it. From I think it was it was town team, maybe under 11s or under 13s. It was. Um, we played at Beale Little School in 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 uh, in Salford. Um, and Moz got sent off for a for a swinging high tackle. I remember the half time our our coach it was uh, Ian McCorkadale, uh, the old ex Oldham player, uh, and he said I don't like seeing kids on the sideline. So he said you know you've learnt your lesson, come back at half time. <laughs> and he got sent off again in the second half for the same thing. So he's, he's the only man that I've ever seen sent off twice in one game. So you know it's, it certainly stood him in good stead for you know for his for his professional. Uh, He'll secretly career. be quite proud of that as well. Yeah, probably. of course he will. Of course he will. I think we, we all know Moz thrived off, off the physicality and you know and and that you know being a bit of an enforcer on the on the field. Um, you know, I'll never remember. I never forget. You know, being at, at the side of him on that, that opening test match in uh, against Australia when he uh, when he clipped Robbie Cairns. So you kind of come through your youth rugby, picked it up. You you signed papers with with Warrington. 
what were those kind of early years like of really trying to establish yourself as a, a professional rugby league player? Yeah, so I signed I signed for Warrington professional terms as a, as a 14 year old. Obviously, then it was very different. There was no scholarship or anything, so it was literally when you left school. That's when you joined the the academy ranks, and I pretty much bypassed the academy. I played a couple of games straight into the reserve grade, and then made the last four games in the first team in, the, in that first season. Um, it's, it's always something I, I enjoyed. I always thrived off challenging myself against the, you know, the, the, the first team players, uh, wanting to make a name for myself within within the game. And I was always one who, you know, back my own ability as well. You know, don't s sit in the background and, you know, because you're the young kid in the side. You know, if you've got something to say, say it. If, if you've got something to do and you see something, you know, play it. And and that's something that I did. And I think it. It got a lot of respect amongst the players, you know. And then, you know, in that in that first year with with Warrington, I ended up, you know, filling in at games at, at six, you know, playing alongside the likes of Greg Mackey and Kelly Shelford, players like that, you know, playing with my old mate Jonathan Davis, um, which for me as a, as a kid was a, was a dream come true. So I don't want to be kind of too disrespectful to the club. Warrington at that time is. A different prospect, isn't it? With Warrington that we'd be talking about if a player is in your position now. Was it always a kind of thing of perhaps you needed to, to move on to go and achieve what you wanted to achieve? Yeah, hundred percent. And I'd already broke into the the, the the Great Britain squad as well. So I was I was playing with, you know, some of the best players in the competitions, your Farrells, your Gouldings, players who were playing in Challenge Cup finals and winning championships and and I'd just done the six week Oceana tour. Uh, come back from there. We'd sold Yestin to Leeds, which for me was the obvious sign that that Warrington one haven't got the, the financial stability to to go out and and buy players to compete with these sides, uh, and and two you, you don't sell your best young players if you have got that ambition. And I wanted to I wanted to win things in the games. I wanted to play on the biggest stage. It wasn't. It was never the move from Warrington was never about financial gain for me. Warrington always looked after me. You know, unbelievably, I had, I had great relationships with everybody at the club, in, including Peter Hyam, who was the, the chairman. You know, nothing but respect for the guy. Uh, and you know, I, I spoke to, to Peter and he explained this. We were, I think, Warrington was in a desperate position at the time financially, anyway, and he saw you know the sale of me as, as being a way of pretty much saving the club as well, which 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 happened. So talk us through what that process was like in terms of joining St Nellos. Was it was it always Saints? Were there other other avenues, the, the you know the dirty word, the other code, perhaps. Yeah, not 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 the, the code at the time. Um, there was other options. I'd had other, other inquiries from from other clubs. You know, Wigan Leeds were were two in in rugby league. There was a, there was a big one, a great story from uh, the London Broncos. Richard Branson had just bought the Broncos. So when it went public that I'd been granted a, a transfer request, uh, I got a phone call. A guy called Brad Rosser, who was the the chief exec of the Broncos, and he said, would you be willing to come and speak to us? So I said, yeah. I said, you know, and then speak to everybody and then decide what's the best move for, for my career and for my family. Uh, and he said, right, what are you doing tomorrow? So we had, we had nothing on. He said, right, I'm going to send a, send a limo to your house. I was living in, in Springhead in Oldham. So we're going to take you down to Barton. We're going to send Richard's helicopter up for you, fly down to London, show you the facilities at the Stoop where they played at Harlequins, house in Richmond where, where we'll live. And he says, and then on to, to meet the man himself for his house, at his house in Holland Park for dinner. Uh, you know, a bit a bit surreal. <laughs> Remember uh, telling telling Lindsay, and she said, "You're not going to sign for London." Because I mean, London were were probably a top six club at the best. You know, I don't think it'd have been any different than, than than being at Warrington in regards to to winning things quickly. Um, you know, some of the players that they were speaking about signing. Were, were impressive. Uh, so anyway, we, we went down, you know, had an amazing day down down there. And I actually agreed personal terms with London there and then. What was still to be negotiated was the, the transfer fee, what they were gonna, willing to pay Warrington, because transfer fees have pretty much gone out of the game with the, the Bosman ruling. And, and obviously, you know, once that, you know, if they pay half a million pounds for me, I sign a three year deal after that three years, I walk away for free. Um, so, you know, clubs have to take that into consideration, you know, when, when, when buying a player. And that was still to be negotiated with London and, and Warrington. But the following week, you know, Saints coming for me and 
they'd just done the back to back 96, 97 Challenge Cup wins. I knew majority of the players there, and a lot I'd played with at Great Britain, the likes of Chris Joyne, you know, um, Bobby Goulding, you know, Sean Long had just joined. I knew that was a club where you're gonna you're gonna challenge for silverware. It's a club that demands success. It's a it's a club that I always enjoyed watching as a as a player. I think the way they played, you know, the renowned as the entertainers. That's how I like to play the game. I like to play play what you see. And I think Saints have always had that kind of free spirit to, to do that. And it, it was just appealing to me and you know, I went and had talks with Saints, agreed personal terms straight away and then they were willing to stump up, you know, the money to uh, to get me out of Warrington. So fast forward a couple of years again, that decision probably vindicated October ish, nineteen ninety nine, first grand final win. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I speak about that game, and that was real special, probably one of the most special games that I've, I've played in, because my whole reason for leaving Warrington was to play on the big stage and, and this was my, my first opportunity in, in 99. Made it even more special, we were caught by Ellery Hanley, who was uh, who was my hero as a, as a, as a young player. Um, so to to play in that game, to win it, to, to feel what it's like to be on that big stage at Old Trafford was, uh, you know, was, was a bit surreal. Uh, and then to back it up, 2000 the year after um, was, was was special. And internationally, of course, by this point, establishing that Great Britain team, a Great Britain team that would go on to do some pretty impressive things. The, the, the last kind of successful era of that Great Britain team, I guess, over that decade or so that you were you were there or thereabouts, was that always the pinnacle for you when, when international call-ups came around? Yeah, definitely. You know, I I loved, I thrived off playing for, for Great Britain, you know, playing against the best players in the world, you know, ultimately Australia and, and New Zealand, and I think it brought out the best in, in my performances. Uh, it's always something that I really, really enjoyed, stepping up to that next level, that intensity. I'd always back myself. I was always one who, who loved training, I still do. You know, I love training to the, you know, pushing my, my body to the limit. And, and I think, it pays dividends on on that stage. You know, when the game's quicker, you know, when you, you've, you've got to dig in, you've got to push for each other. I think that kind of suited my game. And I love the physicality. I love the aggressive side of it. You know, obviously we've had a, we've had a few set twos with the, the Aussies over the years, but, you know, it's all part and parcel of the game. It's about, it's about winning. It's about trying to win. And um, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed every time I pulled a, a Great Britain shirt on. And I'll, I'm sure I'll miss some obvious names out when I list some of these off. But when you think about that era of Great Britain players that you played in, you talk about Scalthorpe, Long, Farrell, Morley, Peacock. The list is endless. Were you kind of aware at the time of how special that that group of players were? Yeah, and, and that's probably looking back is probably one of the most frustrating things. How close we've been to winning Ashes series. I think 2003 was the obvious one. I think. Probably 75 minutes of all three games we were winning and we got beat 3 0. And it was, a, it was, you know, there was that much in between the teams. Um, and I don't know what it is, whether it's just a mental block that we, we stopped playing or, you know, I, we, we all know the Aussies, they play to the end and, and they'll never give in. You know, Darren Lockyer for me is one of the best players that I've, I've ever played against and he was a clutch player that could come up with. With something and, and often did in, in in those games and um, but you know there, there was a minute gap between them them two sides and you know over that over that period two thousand and one um, two thousand and three two thousand and four were were real special times to be a to be a Great Britain player you know you, you mentioned them guys there you know add Stu Field into that it was probably for me the, the best prop in the in the world at the time. Do you feel a little bit maybe deprived, ripped off that if it had kind of followed the, the natural structure, if it had been organised in that way, there would have been maybe a World Cup in 2004, maybe just as that group was really hitting its peak prime, you'd have gone into a World Cup in 20, in 2004 fairly 
fairly comfortable. Yeah, yeah, and and, and you know, looking back at, at my career and where I was at 2004, and and as I say, you say, your peacocks, your Morleys, your Fieldings, your Farrells, um, all at the at the peak of our career. And yeah, disappointing that you know never really had a proper crack at a, a World Cup. Played in 2000, it was a bit of a stop-start competition for, for myself. Obviously, that was under the, the England banner, and not and not Great Britain. Um, but yeah, 2004. You know that that period from 2000 to 2005 was 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 real special to to represent Great Britain. You kind of alluded earlier that you'd had offers from from rugby union at times. I know from speaking to you previously that you turned down, or believe you turned down offers to go to Australia as well. You stayed with St Helens. What was the kind of thought process behind that? Was it just sheer loyalty to the club? Was it your personal circumstances? No, a bit of everything, to be honest. Um, personal circumstances, I mean, it was 2001, 2002, 2003. I'd had, I'd had offers yeah. from, from the NRL. Um, I missed, we had my son in, in 2000. And... Real f close families, both my family and my wife's family, and obviously Jake was the, the first grandchild, so it was taken in to the other side of the world, which which wouldn't have gone down well with me or, or my family, I, I imagine. Um, but it was also, you know, there, there was there was financial, um, you know, over here was, was was probably better in regards to earnings, exchange rate, tax. You know, it, it wasn't necessarily better in Australia. That's why we had a lot of the top Aussies coming over to, to the UK at the time um, because of the exchange rate and, and the ability to earn more money over here. And then it's, you know, people say, do you not want to test yourself in the NRL? I didn't think I had to test myself in the NRL as a, to prove myself as a, as a player. I think I did that at the international, in the, in the international arena. Um, I, would have, I would have loved to have played in the NRL. You know, week in, week out, and but you know, I, I thought at the, the time, you know, the, the strength of, of Super League. I was in, I was always in a five-year contract at, at St Helens. I was offered new deals halfway through, you know, current deals, and and I just didn't. There was there was more there was more cons and pros to to, to do that. So I don't regret anything, uh, as I don't regret you know switching codes either. Going to change subject slightly mm -hmm. and talk about kind of the, the more on the field rugby side of things you played used to kind of pop up all over the field and fit into various positions but I've always kind of seen you as a, a loose forward is that the position that you've always felt most comfortable yeah it's a position I've always played I think because of how I played the game I had that, that kind of hybrid ability to to play a running game you know to, to roll the sleeves up and, and take the hard yards when, when needed or the ability to play what's in front and, and come up with a, you know, a, a, a pass or a kick, um, and and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the ability to, and the, and the freedom which which come with playing at the Saints as well, to, to to play what you see. You know, we wasn't structured. I wasn't locked in anywhere in any specific, you know, part of the field. Um, so yeah, thirteen has always been has always been my 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 position. There's a couple of years that I obviously filled in at, at six, and and probably two, two of my best years, probably 2001, 2002. It was the two years that I won, I won Man of Steel, at Saints. I think one year, Tommy Martin was missing with an ACL. The second year, Sean Long was missing with an ACL. So it was kind of one less ball player, half back, whatever, on the field, and and probably took on a bit more responsibility, which again was something that I thrived on, and I think brought out the best in me as a as a player. You know, taking that responsibility of, you know, organising a bit more organising of the team, a bit more responsibility on the kicking game. Um, obviously, doing a bit of goal kicking as well, which I always enjoyed. Uh, and I think taking that responsibility, you know, brought out the best in me as a player. You mentioned that kind of versatility in your game. Interesting point about the position of loose forward because I, I can't think, the exception of maybe fallback matching it. There's no position that's adapted and changed as much and as kind of regularly and comes in and out of trends in the same way that 13 does in rugby. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's changed a hell of a lot. And, and for me, as a, as a 13, the way I, I play the game, and, and I think because it adds that, that bit more variety into, into an attack, 
you know, having a having a third team that can that can ball play or can run. Um kind of frustrated me where everyone went, you know, we don't have props and loose forwards anymore. We have middles, we have three middles, you know, your two props and your thirteen, which can all be props or can all be back rowers. Um and it, it for me it's 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 gone very one a, a very one dimensional position. I think there's there's certain players that, that change that, that trend. You know, we speak this year about I think I see Arthur at, at Lee can do that, he can play both. He can he can play a tough, powerful running game or he can it can be creative, he can play at the line and and you know, find space for other other players. I think James Bell at, at Saints has got that ability. Um you know the and I, we like to see that. I think the NRL's gone full circle. You know, I think when 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 I was doing that, they were very one dimensional in, in in the way that they played. But you you know, you look at the likes of Cam Munster now and, and players who can play thirteen. You know, Freddie Fittler was was one way. You know, during my era, who again had the ability to do to do everything. So what in terms of the modern game now, if you were to kind of box off what you would see as the ideal skill set for a loose forward what would you pin those main points as? I think uh, a, a, a dynamic running game you know big strong fit I think the, the ability to cover a, a lot of a lot of yards throughout the throughout the game you know put yourself you know all over the field um, the ability to support the, the half backs in, in the creativity uh, and, and you know put it up with the, the second rows or the, or the 13 and, and pretty much just a bit of a, I always think it's a bit of a free spirit. It's a bit of a free role where you can you can go and find, you know, spaces, you know, create that that extra man, or, you know, I, what I was prided myself was was being the first back behind the ball, you know, being the, the fit one of the of the pack to get behind the ball and and roll the sleeves up, you know, when when needed. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a very hybrid role. I- you mentioned a few names earlier. If you look at the, the Betfred Super League now, who are you a fan of? Who do you think is doing it well? Uh, as I say, I mentioned I mentioned uh, James Bell at, uh, at Saints. I, I like him because he's got the ability. You know, he's not feared of, of, of ripping the ripping the ball in and, and doing the hard yards. He's he's a, he's a competitor, competes for everything. You know, he's aggressive on defence, but he's also got that ability to find that little subtle pass. Um, and I think he's he's one that obviously I see more of more of Saints than I do a lot of the the other sides, but you know he's certainly one. You know Cam Smith at, at Leeds has got has got that ability. You know he's he's grown up as a as a thirteen, probably from my kind of mould as well um, of that. You know player he could he could easily fill in at half backs if if required, and he has done it at Leeds. So I think them kind of players. But you know, I think what you've got to be able to do, you can't, you can't play in a dinner suit. You can't just be a ball player. I think it's a position where, you know, like at times you've you, you've got to get down and dirty, and you, you've got to you've got to get back and you know and do the tough stuff. I'm going to finish off with a question that we're finishing off all of this series with the various guests. So it's a double part. So the first one is if you had to kind of pinpoint one moment in your career as your what you consider the, the best moment, your favourite moment from your career, what would that be? And then the second one is now you're into retirement, away from the game, if there was a kind of bucket list thing that you wanted to tick off in your life, what would it be? Um, special moment for playing, I've probably got two that stand out, um, would be 2004 Challenge Cup final uh, against Wigan. You know, Challenge Cup is, is, a, is a competition that we've all grown up watching on the BBC. Um, you know, I've watched, you know, you like to Valerie Hanley and Cole, you know, walk up them steps at Wembley and lift that trophy in 2004. You know, we beat Wigan, which were, were a phenomenal side. For me, the biggest game in, in rugby league, you know, Saints v Wigan. And to beat them was was special on its own. But to be my first one as, as captain lifting that that, challenge, that iconic Challenge Cup was uh, was something that will never, never, ever leave me. And I think... One that probably matched that would be that that first test in in two thousand and one at Huddersfield uh, when we when we beat Australia. Um, it was one of them games that everything went right for me. You know, I got a couple of tries, a couple of drop goals, but it was just you know we spoke about that that test team of, of that era. Um, 
and that was that was we went into that test series, you know, knowing we could we could win. Um, it was just frustrating we didn't back it up with, with games two and three. And then bucket list in retirement. Bucket list. Um, obviously, still still involved in in the game. Not not as much on the on the on the football side on the coaching. You know, I, I do a bit more of the, of the business stuff and. I've always I've always enjoyed business. It, it aided my retirement to to make that decision. You know when I did, I'd, I'd set things up for for when I finished playing. Um, to be honest, I, I enjoy business. I I enjoy I enjoy stuff out of rugby league. You know, I think when you can dip in, you can you can watch, you can do a bit of media. Um, but one thing when you when you retire as well, you get your life back. You know, rugby league has run my life for, for 25, 30 years, you know, day in, day out. And, you know, when you're in there, you, you're fully committed. Um, I think when you retire, you know, you, you do you do get to enjoy, you know, other things outside the, the game. And um, bucket list for me is, is just, you know, I think I, I've put the same energy and the same passion into, into my business, you know, commitments now that I did when I, uh, when I played. So... Really, just to just to keep working hard and uh, you know and, and be successful. Well, Scotty, thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure catching up. Thank you, mate. But they, I, I couldn't tell the story because they made me sign an NDA at the time. Um, the club's obviously gone bust since, so I can speak about it now. And it was difficult because I just wanted to say, look, I didn't want to go. I got a phone call. It wasn't me pushing this. Um, but at the same time, I was excited to be at Warrington to, to try and get some silverware and be in the big games. Um, so, yeah, so much stick. And it, it all got to the stage where I came off social media and we played Widness in the middle eight at Widness. And we needed to win. It was We were desperately needed to win. And uh, I remember it was Phil Bempf and the referee at the time. He came in and, and he had a word with me and he said, look, we've had reports that they're going to storm the field and they're going to get to you. And if they do, you just run off and, and you get and we'll abandon the game. And I was like, wow, this is, this is too far. And